Hello, my name is Erin Miller. I'm a clinical genetic counselor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. This lecture of the larger cardiology series will be focused on cardiovascular genetic testing, incorporating and applying results. My co-presenter today is Amy Sturm. Accurate genetic testing result interpretation really starts at the time that genetic testing is ordered or requested. Considering what the pretest probability is, how likely are you to identify an underlying genetic change based on the patient's phenotype and family history is really important and really lays the foundation for allowing you and your, your collaborators to provide the best interpretation for the patient and the family. The, the genetic testing piece itself is somewhat straightforward in that it can be done on a saliva sample or on a, a blood, a simple blood sample collected in a, a purple top tube, but deciding exactly what test to order is not necessarily always straightforward. And then the process of interpretation, as we'll focus on today, can be somewhat challenging as well. Although um, quite informative for the healthcare team and the patient and the family. As you've heard in the other lectures in this series, um, the clinical value for genetic testing in cardiovascular diseases has well, been well documented. Testing can allow us to confirm a diagnosis, um, it can guide management for the patient, and it can allow us to identify potentially at-risk or affected family members. While the process of genetic testing begins um, not unlike any other type of test, such as a CBC or lipid panel, I might argue that it, it's one of the most important and has the potential to have the largest impact, as it impacts not only the patient, but their, but their family members as well. So these results might potentially drive treatment, management, screening, and other interventions for, for multiple people. And so it's important that the interpretation of the genetic testing results is accurate, as this information may be used to either remove or assign risk um, based on someone's gene status. I mentioned previously that accurate interpretation begins with requesting the best test, and as you all have heard by now, if you've listened to some of the other lectures, um, that there are guidelines in place for the cardiomyopathies and the in inherited arrhythmias. And while those guidelines are certainly helpful and um, are utilized frequently, there are limitations. Um, they don't currently address all phenotypes. It would be impossible for them to do so, and many of the patients we see have complex disease, so a combination of arrhythmia and cardiomyopathy. Or, for example, they might have left ventricular hypertrophy suggestive of HCM but might have systolic dysfunction. And these are the kinds of cases where larger, um, more broad genetic testing might be helpful, such as some of the expanded gene panels that are now available or even whole exome sequencing. The guidelines also don't address the current clinical testing options. The um, Heart Rhythm Society and European Heart Rhythm Association guidelines from 2011 um, really don't address the, the testing that is available currently that includes um, many more genes that, than were offered at that time. And so as the genetic testing landscape and availability changes, so too must how we utilize these guidelines. So with these larger next-generation sequencing panels, there are opportunities and challenges, as with most types of testing. The opportunities include an increased ability for genetic diagnosis and risk stratification. Um, these larger gene panels are cost-effective, such that you can get um, quite a bit more sequencing data or genetic testing information in one test, as opposed to doing multiple tests or doing things in a, a stepwise fashion. And these broader panels are providing us with improved understanding of some of the genotype, phenotype correlations and disease expression. Challenges include, again, a lack of guidelines or indication for, for testing um, with some diseases. Many of the genes included on some of these large gene panels, um, very little is known about, so gene-specific data may be lacking. Sometimes we refer to these as a gene of uncertain significance. And then, of course, the more genes that you look at or the more sequence data you're looking at, you have an increased likelihood for uncertain or unclear results. Sometimes you get a genetic testing result back. It answers the question. You find the answer you were looking for. But other times, the results are more complex than that. Um, sometimes you may identify more than one genetic variant, and it's not clear how one and or both of those may be contributing to the patient's phenotype. 
Um, and again, as I mentioned before, some of the genes included on these larger gene panels, um, really very little is known about. And so it's, it's hard to determine, even if you find a genetic change in one of these genes, how likely it is to be contributing to the patient's phenotype or what those specific risks might be. I think the other piece is that in addition to the, the sequence data, this, these results must be interpreted in the context of the clinical and family history, preferable by individuals who have disease-specific um, and genetic knowledge. So this may be cardiologists, genetic counselors, laboratory personnel, um, or a combination if you're fortunate enough to work with a, with a team of individuals. So what do the genetic testing results mean? Um, this is sort of a simplistic overview of potential results and what the implications are. So you see in the left, um, genetic test results. These are the possible results that I typically talk with patients um, about at the time of pretest counseling. This is what we could get back. So the terminology used in this slide is reflective of the current American College of Medical Genetics guidelines. You may have seen other terminology used by other laboratories or in the past, although I think most clinical laboratories and genetics professionals are, are trying to be consistent and use the ACMG um, recommended terminology. So pathogenic mutation, in the past you might have heard things like deleterious or disease causing. Um, so a pathogenic mutation or a likely pathogenic mutation would essentially equal a positive result. So this would confirm a diagnosis, would allow you to use that information to um, risk stratify uh, family members. You can identify a variant of unknown or a variant of uncertain significance. This is an, an unclear result, and really this information or a result like this should not be used to make medical management decisions for the patient, should not be used to determine risk status of other people in the family. You can also identify um, a variant that is thought to be likely benign, or you can not identify any variants. In some ways, sometimes receiving a positive result is the most straightforward. If you receive a VUS or a, a likely benign variant or a normal result, um, it's important to consider if additional genetic testing um, is indicated at this current time. Important to revisit the option of additional genetic testing certainly in the future as well. So what I'm going to do now, along with my colleague Amy Sturm, is walk you through a few case examples to demonstrate different types of genetic testing results that you can receive in the clinical setting and, and how that information was used then for patient and family management. So the first case example is a 42-year-old male who experienced a sudden cardiac um, arrest while driving on a, a large interstate highway. He actually crossed, was, was headed southbound, crossed the northbound lane, and regained consciousness when um, his feet were getting wet. His vehicle was actually submerged into a retention pond outside of a hotel. He was able to climb onto the roof of his car, climb up the embankment, uh, amazingly experienced no physical trauma from the, from the actual car accident. He reports no prodrome, um, no symptoms at all prior to the event. It was after a day of work, so it was um, you know, evening, late afternoon time of day. He did report that he was congested the day of the event, but otherwise you know, was feeling quite typical. So following his arrest, he underwent a, a fairly comprehensive evaluation. He had an echocardiogram that was normal. He had a head and cervical spine CT that was normal. Cardiac cath did not demonstrate any evidence of coronary artery disease. He did have a resting electro electrocardiogram with um, the V1 and V2 leads placed in the third intercostal space, and that elicited a type 1 Brugada pattern. At this point is when I met with the patient. So a type 1 Brugada pattern in a 42-year-old male who experienced a, a sudden cardiac arrest um, certainly meets the diagnostic criteria for Brugada syndrome. This was the initial um, pedigree or family history that had been collected. He has two siblings, um, both brothers, ages 40 and 46. His parents are both still living in their 70s. Um, no real history of early, um, early death or unexplained death. No history of sudden cardiac arrest. Interestingly, um, he has two nephews that were ages 16 and 18 that had come to see us for clinical, eva clinical evaluation and genetic counseling um, prior to his visit with us. So this family came to us 
concerned about the the family history and the arrest in the uncle, our um, the proband in this family, and so his two nephews had been seen previously by a pediatric cardiologist and had had normal resting EKGs and normal Brugada um, EKGs, so with the um, elevated lead placement. Um, no evidence of a Brugada pattern, no history that was concerning in either of them. So we recommended a Brugada syndrome gene panel and facilitated this testing. I've included the, the guidelines here that suggest that genetic testing can be useful when a suspected clinical diagnosis of Brugada syndrome is made. Um, and the guidelines do recommend known variant testing in relatives if a pathogenic variant is found in an affected individual. We received the results back, and, identif and the laboratory identified a variant in the SCN5A gene, which is the gene primarily implicated in Brugada syndrome. This was a missense variant at amino acid position 279, and the typical lysine was replaced with an arginine. The clinical laboratory interpreted this variant to be pathogenic. Um, I included likely pathogenic here. I think that was essentially our, our clinical interpretation. This variant was novel, meaning it had never been previously reported in association with disease, but was absent from large control populations, suggesting that it wasn't a benign, rare variant. In addition, this particular genetic change was located in a region of the gene where multiple pathogenic missense variants had been identified previously in individuals with Brugada syndrome. So our thought was that this variant was certainly a very likely candidate to be disease-causing or pathogenic in this family, but the fact that it was novel made us hedge just a bit and, and add the, the qualifier of likely in there in, in our own clinical interpretation. So if we return to the family history, um, we recommended both cardiac screening in conjunction with known variant testing for the at-risk family members. You can see his two children um, had come to see us, and one of them had had a type 2 pattern on resting EKG, but no history of syncope, no other reported CV symptoms, um, and his daughter had had a, a normal um, EKG with no history of CV symptoms. And his son was also found to have inherited the SCN5A variant. His daughter tested negative. Um, so we recommended um, ongoing routine cardiac screening for his son with, with aggressive fever management and, of course, avoidance of medications um, known to be contraindicated in individuals with Brugada syndrome. Interestingly, um, the, his brother's family presented to us maybe a year or so after um, we had received the genetic testing results, and these were the two nephews who had had normal screening ECGs prior to the gene testing in the proband. Um, one of the primary reasons that they came back to see us is that um, his 18-year-old nephew had recently experienced new onset seizures. Um, these events sort of initiated when he was walking. He had gotten up to get something to drink after um, having a meal. His lips were reportedly blue by observers. He was shaking and convulsing. Um, he was taken to the ED, had a CT, and all of his evaluations were essentially normal. He had a second seizure on the way home, um, returned to the hospital, had a head MRI, a 24-hour EEG was normal. He did not have any cardiac monitoring during either event, unfortunately. Um, this nephew did test positive for the familial SCN5A variant. His father, the proband's brother, who's 47 years of age, um, had conduction delay on his resting EKG and no history of syncope. He did have, have a single PVC, but both his brother and his 18-year-old nephew tested positive. His other nephew tested negative. So the family of the 18-year-old with seizures actually elected to proceed with ICD placement. He's currently a freshman. Um, at a university. It's, it remains unclear if the seizures were sort of primary seizures or secondary to an arrhythmia, but given the family history and the gene testing results, the family was quite anxious and, and elected to go the route of an ICD. He's doing quite well, has not received any shocks. Um, there is still a, a brother and his parents that have not yet undergone um, either genetic testing or cardiac screening, so there's still some work for us to do in this family in terms of evaluating all, all at-risk individuals. So the second case example um, is a 17-year-old who presented with sudden cardiac arrest um, four years ago, um, which occurred while she was at a school dance. Uh, EMS arrived on scene, um, 
quite quickly, they, they did find that she was in ventricular fibrillation. She was able to be cardioverted successfully. She had a, a pretty extensive workup following that event. Cardiac imaging showed a, a slightly depressed ejection fraction of around 45%. Otherwise, her cardiac workup was completely normal, normal LV size, normal dimensions, no other evidence of, of arrhythmia or other cause for her event. Unfortunately, um, she experienced a, a very good neurologic recovery without insult, and she underwent ICD implantation. So over the next few years, following the placement of her device, she experienced a number of arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation, um, non-sustained VT, and ventricular fibrillation, some of which did not require device therapy, other of which did. All of the events that required a therapy occurred with either strenuous activity or emotional ability. And then um, last year, she, this patient again experienced palpitations, collapsed while leaving class. There was a bystander who initiated CPR, EMS arrived, she was found to be in ventricular fibrillation. Again, this is with her device in place. After device interrogation, it demonstrated that she had had six shocks which were successfully converted um, which successfully converted the ventricular fibrillation, um, but was not successful in terminating the AFib. So after the six shocks, the device stopped working. Um, miraculously, after undergoing, again, a hyperthermic cooling protocol, um, she had a, a good neurologic result. Cardiac imaging was repeated. Her um, imaging was essentially unchanged, so her ejection fr fraction was still mildly reduced. Mind you, this was after an arrest. But she now had evidence of left ventricular noncompaction. So it's at this point that, that I come to know this patient and the family. So you see her here indicated with the arrow. Um, she's now 21 years of age, um, history of sudden cardiac arrest, and idiopathic V-fib at age 17 with multiple device therapies now. So when she had first presented four years ago, um, cardiac screening had been initiated in her first degree family member. So her parents who were in their 50s both had normal echocardiograms and a older, normal Holter. Um, her brother uh, also had normal imaging and a normal Holter. Really no other family history of um, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, sudden unexplained death, nothing else in the family to really guide us. And at the time that she had initially been seen, she had had some, some baseline genetic testing ordered that included sequencing of genes associated with long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, as well as catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, and all of that initial genetic testing had been normal. So she was referred for sort of further evaluation and trying to better understand if there was an underlying genetic etiology for her history of arrhythmia. So everyone involved with her care was really suspicious that there was something genetic going on. Her presentation history was most suggestive of CPVT with this ventricular tachycardia associated with exertion and emotional ability. She had prior sequencing of the ryanodine receptor 2 gene, or RYR2, which is the gene that accounts for um, the majority of cases of CPVT. The yield of that testing, however, isn't great. Only about 50 to 60 percent of individ individuals with a clinical diagnosis of CPVT will actually have a a positive genetic testing result or molecular confirmation of the clinical diagnosis. Um, we were considering the trabeculations that were suggestive of left ventricular noncompaction and had thought about, you know, doing an even larger gene panel, including cardiomyopathy genes. We even talked about doing whole exome sequencing. However, there were some reports in the literature of left ventricular noncompaction and CPVT being associated with large deletions of the RYR2 gene. And the prior testing that she had included only sequencing, so a large deletion of this gene would not have been previously detected. Um, I've included just a couple of the, the nice papers here that have outlined um, the association of RYR2 deletions with a CPVT and cardiomyopathy phenotype. So we requested deletion duplication testing of the RYR2 gene, and the results came back positive. So what we found was a 690 base pair deletion that encompassed exon 3. It was interpreted to be pathogenic. Um, similar deletions had been previously reported and functionally characterized um, by both the laboratory and in the literature. And here you just see a, a brief cartoon here to take you back to basic genetics. So the introns are um, outlined here in blue and the exons in orange. And so 
what happens is that the, the introns are eliminated and the exons are spliced together. And what happened in our patient and in other patients with this deletion is that there was a, a variant in the DNA sequence that resulted in essentially removal of one of these exons altogether. So there's a large ch chunk of important coding sequence um, that is deleted or missing. So this table comes from a paper published by Ono et al. in 2013, and they looked for deletions of the RYR2 gene in 24 probands who prevent, presented with a CPVT phenotype that had previously had negative or normal sequencing. And in two of those 24 probands, they identified a deletion encompassing exon 3. And these two families are listed here as number family number 7 and family number 8. This table also summarizes those cases in the literature of RYR2 deletions that had been previously published. And what I wanted to point out here is that the presence of LV dysfunction was seen in around 17%, so certainly the vast majority of individuals had normal function. 30% had left ventricular noncompaction, 80% had ventricular arrhythmias, and 55% had atrial arrhythmias. Again, we identified this deletion of exon 3 in the RYR2 gene that was interpreted to be pathogenic. Um, it did have an impact on her management. There was some question initially, well, does she have a primary arrhythmia, arrhythmia or does she have a primary cardiomyopathy? Um, and this really suggested that the primary phenotype was related to CPVT. She was started on flecainide and natalol. Um, given her severe phenotype, she actually underwent a bilateral sympathectomy. Um, following that, she didn't exhibit any further arrhythmias until she received multiple shocks during a period of medication noncompliance, but she's otherwise doing well. So the, the results were integrated into her overall management plan and care. We did um, facilitate genetic testing in her parents, and neither of them had this deletion, which suggests that it was de novo in our patient. So it removed risk from a number of other family members, um, such that people didn't require ongoing cardiac screening or any kind of genetic testing. Despite the fact that this deletion was new in our patient, her future children will have a 50% chance of inheriting the deletion and the associated um, risk for arrhythmias. I think interestingly, um, just to, to highlight sort of the, the rapid change in the availability and type of genetic testing that's, you know, that's done is that, you know, now five years ago or so when this patient was initially seen, the larger gene panels, um, including both sequencing and deletion duplication testing, weren't available. So I think if this patient presented today, um, she may have had a larger arrhythmia panel that would have included sequencing and deletion duplication testing, and, and the multiple tests likely would not have been ordered. We would have probably found the underlying molecular cause more quickly. So a final case example, and this is a, a case that I just saw, so I don't have complete um, updated family history information, but it, it's one that was, was interesting to me and so wanted to share with you. So this individual um, was actually referred to me by, I think, his, his children's pediatrician because the family was expressing some concern about, about the children's risk for developing heart muscle disease. So he was a 27-year-old gentleman who initially was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy at the age of 21. He had typical growth and development as a child, never had any um, syncopal events, but did report some near syncope with position changes. Um, he initially presented at the age of 21 again at the prompting of his wife because he was complaining of, of some cardiovascular symptoms that he really described as tachycardia. So an echo initially done demonstrated an injection fraction of 35% with LV dilation. He had a left heart cath, which demonstrated normal coronaries. He's now on medical therapy, um, Coreg and lisinopril, reports that his EF has improved. I think the most re recent echo I show suggested that he had moderate LV dilation, but with an EF of between 45 and 50%. No evidence of ventricular tachycardia or SVT on Holter. He does have frequent PVCs. And again, the family history is really unremarkable from a cardiomyopathy standpoint. His parents are in their mid-50s. His mother has a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, has a 23-year-old brother and a 26-year-old sister, both of whom are alive and well and in good health. He has four children, and actually I just learned he's got a fifth on the way, all of whom are healthy with, with normal growth and development.
So we elected to request a larger gene panel. It included 51 genes associated with um, inherited cardiomyopathies. You see um, a snapshot from the genetic testing result report here. Um, we identified, they identified um, a variant in three different genes, DMD, FK, FKTN, and MYBPC3. And DMD and MYBPC3 are quite familiar to me. Um, to be honest with you, I, I know nothing about FKTN, or at least I didn't at the time that I received these genetic testing results. So the latter two variants were interpreted to be of unknown significance, and the, the first variant in DMD was in, interpreted to be pathogenic or disease-causing. Um, primarily because other deletions in the DMD gene, including this region, had been reported previously in patients with Becker muscular dystrophy, as well as in a cohort of patients who presented with isolated dilated cardiomyopathy. So just a little bit about the dystrophinopathies. It's a spectrum of muscle diseases ranging from mild to severe. Sort of the most mild end of the spectrum would be somebody who is clinically asymptomatic but has elevated levels of serum um, creatinine phosphokinase to the more severe end of the spectrum that can cause progressive skeletal muscle disease in the form of Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, and Becker muscular dystrophy. There is a subset of individuals that have primary cardiac involvement, either with limited or no skeletal muscle involvement. The term used to describe um, this particular phenotype is the DMD-associated cardiomyopathy. In one paper published in Jack in 2011, there were 34 individuals who had DMD-associated cardiomyopathy that presented with primary DCM without uh, any other evidence of, of skeletal muscle disease. Upon further evaluation, 82% of these individuals had either reported muscle weakness or isolated elevated serum CPK. But there were a subset, 18%, that had normal serum CPK levels and really only had involvement of the um, heart muscle. So. This was a surprise for our patient and for the healthcare team. Um, he's never had a serum CPK done previously, and so it's recommended that that be done. He doesn't report, um, sort of in retrospect, any evidence of muscle weakness, which, which tends to be um, proximal instead of distal, so he doesn't report any, any weakness in his, in his quads. I asked about calf hypertrophy. He shared that he um, was a prior mountain biker and so had more developed calves, but he was a relatively competitive mountain biker that um, didn't have any, any fatigue or muscle weakness associated with that. Um, he was recently seen by his internal medicine physician because of elevated liver enzymes that were done just as part of routine lab work regarding his heart failure therapy. And it had been noted um, in some individuals with both Duchenne and muscular dystrophy that elevated transaminases um, could be secondary to occult muscle disease, and so we made his, his outside healthcare providers aware of that. Certainly could be unrelated, um, but I think just wanted everyone to keep that in mind to avoid unnecessary and further diagnostic testing um, in case those two things may be related. He'll be referred to neurology for you know, a more um, specific workup related to this. There is some um, outcome data related to individuals who have heart failure because of DMD gene deletions. Unfortunately, the outcomes are not great, and some of the, the poor predictors would be an increase in the size of the LV, a lower ejection fraction, and outcomes seem to be worse in individuals who had normal serum CPK levels and absence of skeletal myopathy. So while not not heartening information, potentially informative for, for long-term management and care, and I think certainly really close clinical follow-up of, of his heart failure is, is going to be incredibly important for him. So what about those other two variants? The laboratory interpreted both of these to be of uncertain clinical significance. Upon further review and in consideration of, of all of these results together in the family history, the myosin binding protein C3 variant has been observed in around 1 in 430 healthy control individuals, and I think clinically at this time we expect that this variant is, is likely to be benign. Um, the FKTN gene is associated with a type of congenital muscular dystrophy. However, this is an autosomal recessive condition, meaning a single heterozygous change, as was identified in our patient, is not known to cause any type of cardiac phenotype, although there's limited numbers um, and data. 
and so this is this is an autosomal recessive condition. He would only be a carrier even if the variant was thought to be clinically significant, which at this point there's not enough data. So we aren't currently using these variant results for medical management or risk assessment in the family, but are recommending reinterpretation um, in about two years or so. So what are the family implications of this particular variant? So unlike most forms of familial dilated cardiomyopathy, um, this is inherited in X-linked pattern as opposed to autosomal dominant. So that means that all of his daughters must be carriers of this deletion. Um, so he's a male, he has an X and a Y chromosome. We know that his only X chromosome um, includes this deletion of the DMD gene. Thus, in order for him to have a daughter, that's the only X chromosome he can pass on. And likewise for his sons, we know he's passing on his Y chromosome, so none of his sons will be um, carriers of this deletion. So for his daughters, who are, are now quite young, just ages 8 and 2, current guidelines from the Muscular Dystrophy Association um, recommend cardiac screening around the age of 20. It's pretty well documented that females who are carriers of DMD deletions or point mutations do have a, an increased risk for developing cardiomyopathy over a lifetime, although it tends to be later in terms of age of onset and more slowly progressive. It's not clear if our patient inherited this um, deletion from his mother uh, or if it occurred de novo in him. In general, about one-third of, of males who have a DMD gene variant um, have, you know, have a new variant that didn't come from their mother. So at this point in time, we're recommending um, gene testing in his mother and his siblings. There's a well-reported cases of germline mosaicism, meaning that even if his mother tests negative, meaning she doesn't have this deletion in her bloodstream, she could have this particular deletion in um, the cells that are precursors to the sex cells or the germ cells. And so it is possible um, that one of his siblings could have inherited this even if his mother tests negative. So we're, we're recommending um, DMD known variant testing for his mother and his siblings. So a bit of a surprise for this patient. Again, um, he's not had the chance to complete some of the additional workup and blood work that's been recommended, but I think it will be informative um, for his overall health in terms of whether or not he's going to have some skeletal muscle involvement or not. I'm going to, to hand the talk over now to my colleague, Amy Sturm. We'll now move on to a case example for a cardiomyopathy patient. This was a 36-year-old Caucasian woman, and she had had onset of an idiopathic, severe dilated cardiomyopathy when she was just 31 years of age. She had had symptom onset for a few weeks without any known obvious trigger at all. She underwent echocardiogram, and this showed a left ventricular end diastolic dimension of 7.2 centimeters, so definitely a quite enlarged left ventricle. Her ejection fraction was approximately 10 to 15 percent. She also underwent cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and this again confirmed a dilated left ventricle, severe global hypokinesis, an ejection fraction of 19 percent, and she also had some moderate right ventricular systolic dysfunction with biatrial enlargement and some fibrosis upon gadolinium enhancement. She went emergent ventricular assist device placement, was treated medically, and over time did quite well and actually improved to the point where her ventricular assist device was able to be explanted about one year after her initial diagnosis. She continued to undergo very close and careful follow-up with full medical therapy and follow-up echocardiogram continued to show a dilated left ventricle with approximately a 5.8 centimeter left ventricular end diastolic dimension and an ejection fraction that did improve somewhat up to approximately 30 to 35 percent. She also had an implantable cardiodefibrillator in place and had not received any shocks to date. This patient was referred to the cardiovascular genetics team and as a first step, a detailed pedigree was collected and analyzed by the genetic counselor. As you can see, this patient has an older sister, an older brother, and a younger sister. 
Her parents are 62 years of age with no known heart disease. You can see on her mother's side of the family, with her mother being represented as the 62-year-old circle or female, there are several individuals, but no known heart disease in her sibship. However, interestingly, there is a remote family history on the maternal side of a first cousin once removed who also had been diagnosed with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and had undergone heart transplant. Also, on her paternal side of the family, while her father at the time that she was first evaluated was not known to have any cardiac symptoms, nor were there any known individuals in his sibship with heart failure or cardiomyopathy, his father did die at the age of 49 suddenly. This patient underwent genetic testing with a comprehensive cardiomyopathy genetic testing panel, and her results are summarized here in this table. You can see that she was found to have different genetic variants in three different genes the myosin binding protein gene, the troponin C or TNNC1 gene, and LAMA4. These are three different genes known to be associated with different types of cardiomyopathy. Also included this table are the DNA change, the effect on the actual protein, the minor allele frequency or MAF, which shows data from different population databases about how frequent this variant may be or if it has been seen at all in different population databases who have undergone extensive DNA sequencing. This data is helpful as the more rare the variant, the higher likelihood we think it may indeed be pathogenic or disease associated. Finally, in the last column, you can see the CLIA lab's interpretation of the variation. Now, when we look at the myosin binding protein variant, interestingly, as you can see with the star below, this variation had been reported previously, but in association with a different cardiomyopathy, HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a splice site mutation, which is typically thought to be pathogenic. Now, the troponin C variant had never been described before. It was novel. But this was a non-conservative amino acid change from one amino acid to another at a very highly conserved position throughout evolution. And in addition, missense variants in nearby residues have been reported in association with cardiomyopathy. So the variation found in our patient was at position 149 in the troponin C protein and other variations at position 134, 145, and 148 had been seen. Also, the minor allele frequency of this variation was 0% in European Americans, meaning this is a very rare variant. And therefore, the lab stated that they thought that this variant had a high likelihood to be disease-causing. The LAMA4 variant was also novel, and this was at a position that is not very well conserved throughout evolution, and no nearby variants had ever been reported in association with cardiomyopathy. Therefore, there was not really enough data to say whether this variant may be pathogenic or benign, and it was called as a variant of unknown significance. Here you can see the updated pedigree with our proband's genetic testing results listed under her, with the three different variants that had been identified in three different cardiomyopathy genes. Interestingly, about six months after we first evaluated this proband, her sister presented to medical care as she had been diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy after the delivery of her last child. So now we do have a positive family history of peripartum cardiomyopathy in our proband sister, making this a true familial cardiomyopathy. Interestingly as well, the father reported that he had subsequently had an abnormal echocardiogram too and that he was experiencing symptoms of congestive heart failure. Therefore, we moved on and ordered targeted testing for the three variants that had previously been found in our proband in the affected sister. We did this to perform what is called segregation testing 
to see which of the three variants were also present in her affected sister of the initial three that had been found in our proband. Again, highlighting in red, the father, who is now suspicious that he may also have signs of this potential familial genetic cardiomyopathy. Here you see the results of the testing that had been performed in the sister. So upon her targeted testing for these three different cardiomyopathy variants or possible cardiomyopathy variants, she was not found to have that myosin binding protein splice site variant, the one that had been previously seen in association with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. However, she did test positive for the novel troponin C variant that was likely disease causing. And so now we have segregation in the affected sister. She did not test positive for the novel LAMA4 variant of unknown significance. This slide highlights all of the different people in this large family that with the genetic testing information we were able to glean in this case, the additional people who have question marks, who we don't know their current genetic status, that may be able to be helped by targeted predictive genetic testing and clinical screening with echocardiogram, EKG, history, and physical by a cardiologist. You can see that the next steps would be to recommend cascade testing and clinical screening in a cardiology setting for all first-degree relatives of these two sisters. So it would be very important to go up the family tree to the parents and fully evaluate both the father and mother to see do either of them truly have signs and symptoms of cardiomyopathy. If they do, additional variant segregation testing could be done in the parents, and we could see who did these two girls inherit their troponin C variant from? Is it the father with the possible symptoms of congestive heart failure? Is it the mother? We could also see are the myosin binding protein variant and LAMA4 variant that were identified in our initial proband novel, de novo, just in her, or were they inherited from one of the two parents? This would be very helpful to see could it potentially track with the distant family history of non ischemic cardiomyopathy and heart transplant on the maternal side, or even possibly the history of sudden death on the paternal side. And so these are the types of investigations that are very important to carry out as you continue to work through the genetic testing process with patients. You can also see that in these two sisters' sibship, testing and cardiology evaluation would be recommended to their brother and to their younger sister. For the younger sister, if she tests positive for the troponin C, likely disease-associated cardiomyopathy variation, it would also be important for her children to be evaluated. And for the sister with peripartum cardiomyopathy, you can see that she has multiple children who would definitely benefit from cardiology, clinical screening, as well as potential genetic testing for the troponin C, likely disease-associated variant that was also identified her in this familial cardiomyopathy case. You can see how that, as we continue to work with families like this, the clinical picture and the family history continues to unfold as additional family members get evaluated and present to medical management. And you can see the utility also of cascade clinical screening and cascade genetic testing to identify others who may be at risk and need cardiology screening and management. Next, we'll present the following case. This is a 51 year old African American male. His past medical history includes hypertension. He presented after developing chest pain while he had been playing basketball. He underwent stress testing and eventual left heart catheterization, which demonstrated diffuse right coronary artery disease, an occluded proximal circumflex, and 90% blockage in his mid left anterior descending coronary artery. At that time, he received a drug-eluting stent placement to the mid-LAD. He had never been a smoker, and his family history did include a mother with hyperlipidemia, but no known family history of premature coronary artery disease. 
Upon physical examination, it was negative for any signs of tendon xanthomas. And his baseline lipid lab showed a total cholesterol of over 300, an HDL that was relatively low at 31, normal triglycerides at 113, and a significantly elevated LDL cholesterol level of 292. This LDL cholesterol is definitely above that 190 cut point level where practitioners should suspect the possibility of familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. Upon scoring him on two of the different FH clinical criteria for scoring, the Simon Broom Register and the Dutch Lipid Clinic score, he had either possible or definite familial hypercholesterolemia. This shows this patient's pedigree. As you can see, there is not a strong family history of coronary artery disease. Both of his parents are 75 years of age. His father, represented by the square, is overall alive and well or healthy with no known heart disease. His mother is 75 and is reported to have high cholesterol and on medication. She does not have any known coronary artery disease. This patient's maternal grandfather did die in his 60s due to a myocardial infarction in his sleep. Our proband had a younger brother who was not known to have high cholesterol or coronary artery disease, and he also had a younger sister who did have high cholesterol and was on medication for that. He had told us that he had already recommended to his daughter that she have her cholesterol checked based on his very high total and LDL cholesterol levels, and that her recent cholesterol Straw check was okay. This slide shows the therapy that this patient was undergoing. He was currently on a dose of azetamibe of 10 milligrams every day and colacevalam of one tablet daily. He had unfortunately had reported intolerance in the form of myalgias to multiple different statin medications over the course of 10 years. He had unfortunately had aching pains that resolved when the statin was not being taken. However, he had never tried Resuvastatin, also known as Crestor. Given his history of statin intolerance, the lipid clinic team checked a baseline creatine kinase level, and he was also referred to a neuromuscular specialist. He underwent an EMG, which was felt to be normal, and it was felt that it would be safe for him to try to resume taking a statin medication, starting out at a low dose. So he started on low-dose Crestor and continued his azetamibe at the same dose and increased his colacevalam to six tablets daily. Over the course of time, he had progressive chest pain on exertion and ended up having to have a drug-eluting stent placed to his left marginal artery. He continued to undergo surveillance by the lipid clinic team. And on recheck of his cholesterol, his total cholesterol was still above 300, and his LDL cholesterol, while it had gone down, it only went down by about 50 points to 243, still significantly elevated and not to goal where it should be. So his Crestor was increased to 5 milligrams daily. Creatine kinase was rechecked, and it was felt that based on the evaluation again from the neuromuscular team, that it was okay to continue this dose and continue to increase it cautiously as this patient still needed to get to goal, as is seen with many patients with FH. Therefore, his Crestor was increased and the dose was doubled to 10 milligrams daily. However, he started developing intolerable muscle aches and his Crestor had to be lowered back down to the initial dose of 5 milligrams daily. At that point, the patient was referred to the cardiovascular genetics clinic, and it was discussed that he may even classify for certain novel medications like mipomersin or lamidipide. But given his lack of strong family history and the lack of physical signs like tendon xanthomas, it was difficult to try to determine whether he may be a homozygote or a compound heterozygote. Genetic testing was pursued and obtained. In the interim, the patient actually stopped all of his medications, and his LDL jumped up over 300. 
His genetic testing results came back, and indeed, it was positive for a pathogenic mutation in the most common gene for FH, the LDL receptor gene. He was found to have a duplication of a single nucleotide that caused a frame shift of the protein with an alternate stop codon, therefore being produced. This mutation had been previously identified in multiple other individuals diagnosed with definite or possible FH, and therefore it was thought that this mutation was definitely pathogenic in this patient. And because this mutation was found in this patient, it was confirmed that at least he was heterozygous FH, and based on his high significantly elevated LDL, he may even be reaching that of a functional homozygote status. It was determined from his lipid clinic physicians that he was a candidate for LDL apheresis. Based on his very high LDL levels, how they were not coming down enough based on his combination therapy, and based on the fact that he already had significant obstructive coronary artery disease. The lipid clinic team also began the authorization process for one of the newly approved PCSK9 inhibitors, and this ended up being approved so that he could initiate a lorocamab medication as well. So bringing this back to his pedigree, and bringing it back to look at how this type of information can be helpful. We know that based on the fact that this patient was indeed found to have a pathogenic gene mutation in the LDL receptor gene, cascade genetic testing can now commence. And as you can see, this would be recommended to all of his first degree relatives, his mother, his father, his brother, his sister, and his daughter. In addition, if his mother indeed end up being the parent that tests positive, which was the thought process that we were heading down since she was known to have high cholesterol that were requiring medication, and since her father died of a myocardial infarction in his 60s, it is likely that his maternal half-sister and maternal half-brother would also require genetic testing to see did they or did they not inherit the LDLR gene mutation and then subsequently, could their children also be at risk? In summary, these are the key points that we hope you understand about genetic testing and how results from genetic testing can be used. To start, genetic testing should be considered for a wide number of cardiovascular conditions. This includes familial hypercholesterolemia, multiple different types of cardiomyopathies, as well as inherited arrhythmias, and as well are familial aortic aneurysm and dissection syndromes that are isolated, as well as the syndromic conditions, Marfan and Lois Dietz syndromes. Hopefully these case studies have shown to you how genetic testing can improve patient care, confirm diagnosis, and lead toward cascade genetic testing in families. Again, genetic testing can help us confirm a genetic diagnosis it can help confirm a genetic etiology when disease presents as idiopathic or unknown cause. This can help with the anticipation of future syndromic features and can be used in cascade genetic testing to identify other at-risk relatives who need cascade clinical screening in a cardiology setting as well. Many patients also use this information for family planning, prenatal testing, or testing of children after children are born to determine whether they may require cardiology surveillance, as well as specific activity planning as well. In summary, a collaborative multidisciplinary team is key to bringing cardiovascular genetic and genomic medicine to our patients. We hope that cardiologists, cardiac nurses, genetic counselors, clinical geneticists, and laboratories can work together to optimize the care that these families and patients need. It's important to know and remember that if genetic testing cannot be completed or if genetic testing does not find the actual genetic reason that a family has a familial condition, at-risk relatives still need to undergo clinical cardiovascular screening. This is absolutely imperative and should be gun to be initiated in all at-risk first-degree relatives, and if additional asymptomatic 
relatives are then diagnosed with the cardiovascular condition, stepwise clinical screening should then commence in all of their first-degree relatives in a stepwise fashion. Family history changes, as you've seen in some of our cases, and therefore this should be periodically reviewed and updated so that familial disease can be confirmed and so that we can continue to make sure all at-risk relatives are being notified and screened when new relatives are diagnosed. Genetic testing results also should be re-reviewed. The classification of genetic variants will continue to change over time as more and more individuals have their DNA sequenced and as more and more of this data goes into publicly accessible databases. And finally, as genetic testing continues to improve and as we learn more and more about new genes that are associated with these cardiovascular genetic conditions, and as the clinical sensitivity of genetic testing improves over time, additional genetic testing may be indicated in the future. We recommend that for our patients who undergo genetic testing that is negative and has not yet identified their underlying genetic etiology, that they continue to recontact us, at least on an annual basis, to see if a new genetic test may be helpful to them in their diagnosis and that could also then be helpful to their family. So let's find the answer together. Thank you very much for your attention during this webinar.